Cinema Talk. Talk. Rafi. In September of 2012, writer and director Ryan Johnson released his film Looper. Although 10 years before that, he wrote a short sketch that was kind of the progenitor of Looper. In his foreword to the sketch, he states, This is the original four-page sketch for Looper, written in 2002. At the time, I intended to film it, just with a video camera and a few friends, but we never did, and it sat in a drawer for seven years. It's presented here for the curious, exactly as I wrote it 10 years ago. Thanks for reading. So let's take a quick look at it and see how it compares to the final product of the film Looper. A man in a coat and hat waits in an alleyway, playing with a pocket watch. Time travel has not been invented yet, but in 30 years, it will be. The mechanical process it requires will be cheap and relatively accessible to the public at large. Needless to say, it will be instantly outlawed, with even unwitting accessories, family, friends, business partners, punished with death. This will not stop certain unscrupulous characters from using it to their own ends. I guess I indirectly fit into that category. With a flash of light, a second man appears in the alleyway. Without hesitation, the first man draws a gun and shoots him. Ah! Main title, Looper. The man goes home, fixes himself a drink. I'm of this time. I'm not from the future. I've kicked around a bit, working as muscle for different crews, scraping by. Then about a year ago, word comes across that a small mob that won't exist until 30 years from now is fishing for a looper. I put out, and I got lucky. I got the job. So I'm employed by this mob as a looper. What's a looper? We see the man retrieve an envelope that has been left under his door. He walks to a blind alley in the city. A looper is a hitman who works exclusively for the mob from the future. When they need someone taken care of, they zap them back in time, to me. A second man appears in the alley. Our man shoots him, then tears open the man's jacket, revealing gold taped to his back. From their end, their problem has just literally vanished. From my end, I've just killed a man who doesn't exist. Add to this the effect of inflation on my fee, and you can see what a mutually beneficial arrangement this is. Back at the man's apartment, drinking. I wouldn't say I'm more alone than most people who are alone. I chose it, at least. I don't complain. I've always said it suits me. I have my hobbies. I'm learning the banjo, and I drink. I I'm just gonna, <laughs> real quick, uh, the banjo bit is particularly funny knowing uh, Ryan Johnson's proclivities for playing the banjo. Here's a small sample from the Slash film cast. Joining us tonight is a very special guest. His 2005 film won the Sundance Special Jury Prize for original... <laughs> <laughs> His 2005 film won the Sundance Special Jury Prize for, <laughs> and that's uh, that's his banjo stylings as well. His Sorry, two it, David, you were saying so. <laughs> thank, thank you for scoring. <laughs> thank you for scoring this review, Ryan. Another envelope under the door, another alleyway. There's a reason we're called loopers. If your mob gets broken up or busted, their first priority is to erase any trace of the worst offense a criminal organization can commit. Time travel. So they close the loop. If you're still alive 30 years from now, they send you back to yourself. And you're expected to do the hit. It's part of the code, part of the job. If you don't, you're marked a half seat, a rat. Every looper knows the day will come. That's why they get guys like me. It's the job. A flash of light and an old man appears. We don't get a good look at his face, but the looper does, and he freezes, gun raised. No, there is a reason I'm telling you this. The old man runs, the looper gives chase. I couldn't do it on the spot, weakness. If I let him get away, I was a dead man. As opposed to what, I'm not sure. They chase each other through the city. The old man gives the looper the slip, leaving an aged photograph, a woman in a hat at the beach. On the back, scrawled, John, 1513. My handwriting, something I should know, something deep and rooted in me, a flash of anger, of whatever it was. If I had any susceptibility to the trappings of proverbial righteousness, I wouldn't still be wearing this hat. The looper picks up the old man's trail and chases him deeper into the city. If I had a nickel for every verse from the good book I had gotten from a condemned man on his knees in an alleyway, 
I live by the sword, cast the first stone. Fear and guilt in the moments before death, I knew him. I was immune. I probably knew this one too, but at the moment, it eluded me. The looper chases the old man into a burnt out building and stops, walking slowly, listening for a sign. At first I thought it was the wind, but then I realized he was talking to me. A low, graveled voice I almost didn't recognize. He was telling me about the woman. It was hard for him. He kept starting and stopping. He spoke deliberately, as if very clearly trying to articulate a focused point, but his words were hazy memories. Vague, but vibrant, emotional impressions of this woman. Fantasy images overtake the looper. The woman. The beach. He began the story of the 30 years between us. His past, my future. How in five years I would meet his wife. The woman who had saved him from my life. The woman he loved more than anything in the world. He told me about a beach. The retrieval of a parasol. The wind. Back to the scene. Footsteps clatter, the old man off again, down the street. By the time I noticed he had stopped talking, he had a good lead. Smart. More chasing. Women, or the realm of women, what they mean to men. I never expected to have that. I'm incompatible. My life at least is. Maybe I don't deserve it. Some recklessness took me. I wanted to put a fist through this life I would built. Why should he die for it? I wouldn't. I won't. I won't kill him. We'll go into hiding, hop a steamer to Havana, run numbers, drink mojitos on the beach, that's what we'll do. I've decided, my mind's made up. He must know what I've decided, because he knows what I'll do, because it's what he did. So, why is he still running? Into a construction site, through the maze of stacked lumber and framed walls. That voice again, carried on the wind, and I felt a panicked urgency to silence it. I'm going to let you live, shut up. 30 years from now and I still didn't know to shut up when I'm ahead. The looper turns a corner and gets a 2x4 in the face. He goes down. The world slurs around him. He didn't say much about her. Three sentences, maybe. Incomplete ones. Specific sense memories, he described. Physical details, which out of context might have seemed obscene, but they were careful. Specifically chosen. Small charges set to start an avalanche of extrapolation. He knew what a thin hand on the back of your neck meant. The woman holds the looper. Somewhere. It meant casual affection without direct motive. It meant she was sticking around. A Sunday love. I didn't love myself enough to even look for that. I felt her breath, steady and sleeping, on my throat, like he said. Offhandedly saving me. Forgiving me my old life. Trusting me in the new one. The cold world slurs back into focus. The looper rises painfully. I found that I'd give up everything I had for it in a heartbeat. And I knew now, from this old man, I knew that I would find it, but not in Havana, not on the run. In the distance, the old man, glancing back, running. I understood then, if I didn't kill him, I'd never find her. He'd have never found her. John 15:13, paraphrased. No greater love than this, to lay down your life for another. His gun has fallen in the scuffle. He picks it up and goes after the old man with grim purpose. For someone else, not yourself. Sure, I'd give up anything for the life of happiness. Who wouldn't? But he would die for her. Not for her forgiveness or love. He'd never see her again and not even have memories where he was going. But the woman who had loved him enough to take him from what he called his life and put her hand on him and sleep against him, for her he would die across broad barren sands, onto a beach, stopping at the shore, exhausted, the old man on his knees. Maybe this is why he ran, so I'd understand this, so I'd have time to understand. And now I did, and right on the money. Now he stopped running. The looper unbuttons his overcoat, swings it open, the gun in its holster, his pocket watch dangling beside it. I could feel her already. I could taste her. This was the last death I'd see. She had saved me from all of it. Now it was just her and her love. And would I someday do what he did and die not for my life with her, but just for her? He told me the end of their story then, the day the mob came to send him back to me. They found them together. As the looper hears the old man's silent words, we see the mob burst in on the old couple. 
the old man tied and gagged, the woman, her face unclear, eyes open in horror as her throat is horribly slashed. And because she was with him, because of him, back to the scene, the looper removes his gun from the holster. I understood. And yes, yes I would. Bang. A hole opens in the looper's chest beside his pocket watch, and he stumbles backwards in the sand, back from the old man, to whom he has just given his gun. I will. The looper falls to his knees, locks eyes with the old man. She saved my life. The looper crumples to the sand and lies still, alone on the wide beach. October 8th, 2002. In watching back my reading, I noticed something unintended, albeit a logical outcropping of the underlying nature of this analysis. I was able to maintain a pretty clear audiovisual coherency at the beginning and end of the reading, but it gets a bit incongruous in the middle. The reasoning behind this is pretty simple. Most of the visuals that lined up with the reading are the parts of the film that most faithfully preserve the ideas communicated in the original sketch. So let's dig a little bit deeper. The opening monologue that describes the function and purpose of a looper is more or less intact, both in the opening scene and in some of the promotional trailers. Time travel has not yet been invented, but 30 years from now, it will have been. They use specialized assassins, like me, called loopers. Which makes a lot of sense, since it's a good, concise bit of exposition. Now, if we look more closely at the dialogue on the first page, we can see these yellow highlights are present in the opening scene, and these red highlights are almost verbatim. And all this voice, this voiceover additionally was, was kind of straight out of the short film. Some of the monologue has been shuffled around a bit, but the biggest difference here is the shift from Joe's introspective backstory and self-reflection to a focus on the world building of the film. There's a lot of time being spent in the sketch where Joe is telling you what he thinks amounts to his character, and the monologue effectively acts as an introduction to him, whereas the monologue as it was adapted to the film is actually more of an introduction to the broad concept of a looper and the environment through which they arose. The audience is able to intuitively understand the character of Joe as a product of these conditions. In fact, a lot of Joe's backstory presented in the sketch never really surfaced in the film, but I think what is here can be inferred out of the film through nonverbal cues. We don't see how Joe first got his job as a looper, but the scene outlining old Joe's timeline feels like it functionally serves the same purpose. Joe's loneliness, and his coping with that loneliness, comes across in Joseph Gordon-Levitt's performance. Then you have some interesting minor adjustments with swapping his drinking to recreational eye drop drugs, which is really just an extension of Ryan Johnson's approach to making a realistic future by taking elements of the present and past and culturing them into a familiar yet foreign variant. The movies that you're dressing like are just copying other movies. It's goddamn 20th century affectations. The part of the speech where Joe describes the meaning of the term looper was large in part the same. The major difference there being the final version withheld the consequences of not closing your loop until about 10 minutes after the speech, when Paul Dano's character suffers those consequences firsthand effectively setting the stakes for the entire film. The visual representation of time travel slightly altered, from appearing in a flash of light to a more bold binary switch in contrast to the mainstream convention of masking the effect with additional elements that are used to blend the effect and the footage together. I remember that was actually something really difficult to communicate. I wanted it to be absolutely nothing when they showed up because when once you know, effects guys look at that and the instinct is to do something like a, you know, time warp effect or mm. to do like a Stargate effect. And I figured it would, the one thing I hadn't seen that I thought would be more cool is just completely unadorned. They're not yeah. there one moment, they're there the next. Are you sure you don't want a little, uh, <laughs> little space ripple? Flare. A little puff of smoke? Yeah. We can do smoke. The hesitation in killing old Joe is still intact as the entire driving force of the plot for both the short film and the feature. Old Joe's wife is introduced a third of the way through the sketch, immediately after Old Joe's arrival in the narrative present, which I thought was much earlier than were introduced to her in the film, but she actually shows up even earlier at 29% of the way through the film, again fairly soon after Old Joe's arrival in the present. So the timing is fairly comparable, but the way she's introduced really underscores a fundamental difference in how the two Joes are portrayed. In the short film, we first see her in a photograph that young Joe looks at 
which distances you from old Joe. This distancing leads to him not actually being very well developed in the short film, and his character ends up existing solely as an extension of young Joe. In the film though, we first see Summer in the montage documenting old Joe's life, so we're seeing her through his perspective. Sharing an experience with the character is a powerful tool that gets us to relate and empathize with old Joe. It helps establish the mirrored relationships of Summer with old Joe and Sarah with young Joe. We need something to make him human so that we understand his motivation as an antagonist, and so he can exist as a character unto himself. And there's no better way to do that than showing that he deeply cares about someone and binding that feeling to him. You could say they put the care into his character. Now this probably isn't intentional, but the lines, my handwriting, something I should know, is brought up in the film, conceptually at least. In the short film, it's old Joe's writings describing something that should happen in young Joe's future. But in the film, it's reminiscent to when young Joe schedules the meeting in the diner by carving his arm. Maybe a bit of a stretch, but I feel like it's indicative of the residue that these broad ideas kind of stick around and end up in the final product. This is actually the beginning of an interesting split from the film. Looper treats the rules of time travel like a messy impressionistic painting, and never really gets buried too deep in the structure and logic of the mechanic. But one of the more striking ways that they depict a connection between the Joes is the hemorrhaging of deformed memories the more the course of events alter in time. This is an integral storytelling device in the film, but basically has no presence in the short film. Although this line seems to echo the way that Ryan Johnson would come to describe the way he envisioned that particular device working. When these paradoxes are created, my notion was that his memories would, would basically do their best to adjust to them. It would be kind of like a painful, cloudy process in his head. But there's also this little line about a hat. Now hats are a symbol in this narrative. Outside of a few extras in the 30-year montage, the only characters who have hats are the Rainmaker's men which is used as a subtle clue to Sid's identity. In the short film, it also represents a symbol of Looper culture, but it more directly serves to act as a metonymy for the Looper's willingness to murder for money. This paragraph is interesting in that it alludes to something we never even see in the film. All of Joe's on-screen hits are, outside of his own, quick with a one-sided authority. There are never any final words, moments of acceptance, or refutal of any kind. There's just a body and a pulled trigger. But this paragraph implies a rich history of victims pleading for their life, or at the very least expressing anything that they were never able to with the impulsive executions of the film. These kinds of things could have still happened in the film's narrative, since it's entirely possible these moments occurred earlier in Young Joe's career, and he's now hardened and detached from the act. We just don't see enough to know. Much of the chase in the short film relies on old Joe's recollections playing off of young Joe's insecurities, which puts him in a distracted state. Funnily enough, this exact same tactic has the opposite effect in the film, where old Joe's characterization of the woman he loves just puts young Joe in a state of indifference. That's not to say that young Joe's intrinsic longing didn't transfer from the short film to the feature, it just shifted from mention of the only woman in the short film to the Piper character. This line particularly stands out to me. In the short film, it's referring to the classic time travel mechanic of causality, where in order for young Joe to live the life that old Joe speaks so highly of, he must preserve the natural order of cause and effect by killing old Joe. In a way, both of their lives are hanging on this realization. I can't overstate the importance of this core concept as it fuels the empathetic, sacrificial turning point in both the sketch and the film. The film does present a slightly different take on the moment of realization though. We've already talked about how messy it views the laws of causality, but in the diner, young Joe embodies that philosophy by suggesting he changed the one event that defines the very core of old Joe's character. Show me the picture and as soon as I see her, I'll walk away. I'll fucking marry someone else. If you give her up, She'll be safe. The film version is coded in an arrogance that becomes a defining trait in Joe's character, both in young Joe's callousness and old Joe's unwillingness to let go. The reveal of Summer's death originally appears in the final moments of the short film, acting as the tipping point for young Joe deciding to save her through his sacrifice, but it got shifted around a bit for the film. Once adapted to the script for the feature length, Summer's death was shown in the 30-year montage following old Joe's life but was again displaced in post-production to be interwoven in the diner scene. Even though it doesn't serve as the big revelation of the short film, it maintains the split structure as it was originally written. 
Originally, we saw that in the original montage. During the course of cutting, it was something that, that came up that was, um, I think it was actually, it might have been Jim Stern, one of our producers, who, who had the idea and threw it out there. And, and it just, it, it played so well holding that piece out. And it also helps to break up the diner scene. A lot of the original ending carried over into the film, along with some notable differences. In broad terms, young Joe always sacrifices himself to save a woman in his life. The short film likes the distinct symmetry that helps connect the Joes and sets them apart. So in the short film, young Joe is determined to close his loop, and along the way, old Joe tells his tale and convinces young Joe to sacrifice themselves for the good of Summer. In the film though, young Joe never actually cares about Summer but in many ways, replaces her with Sarah. This is expressly communicated by old Joe's fading visions of Summer with memories of Sarah interwoven between them. So both Joes end up on a mission to kill for their respective other. Old Joe tries to kill the Rainmaker to save his wife from being murdered, and young Joe kills himself to save Sarah and Sid from being murdered. But the parallels don't stop there. Just as old Joe created his own moment of departure by disrupting the timeline and escaping the closed loop, young Joe creates his moment of departure by sacrificing himself for another and disrupting the established Rainmaker loop. So even though the actions of both the short film and the feature length closely resemble each other, the meaning behind those actions vastly differ. All of this mirroring just goes to show that in many ways they're still the same person. But the major difference here being that young Joe has an arc where he learns to sacrifice selflessly, a feat he struggles with throughout the film. And that's many ways in which the four page short film outline compares to the feature length film. But as with any analysis, there's always more to consider. If there's anything notable you picked up on, leave them in the comments, then go watch Looper again.